taste of what's coming when we meet our Lord in the sky. I'm being really blessed by all of the fellowship and the discussion and uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the presentation last night where Matthew uh, challenged my thinking on some things and it's good to make you go back and study and compare. So, uh, And this morning I had some thoughts uh, and I want to share a little bit of that. You might say that this is bread fresh off out of the oven because uh, uh, it's just some thoughts that have come to me and, and, uh, and questions I've been thinking about. I want to tie up a couple of things, a, a few points that were not quite clear in my last presentation. And then I want to go into uh, the first angel's message, the investigative judgment, the hour of his judgment has come, share with you a little bit of my experience uh, in relation to this teaching of the first angel and see if we can draw some conclusions from, from that. So if we can kneel, if possible, I'd like to pray. Father, what a joy it is to come to you during the time of tabernacles. We thank you that you have called us into rest, the rest of the Sabbath, and during this time we are being blessed with your rest. We believe this by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I pray for the words to speak and that you would bless our time together and that you would draw us into a deeper understanding of your great love for us. I pray these things, Father, in the name of your blessed Son. Amen. So just, just a couple of things I wanted to clarify in regard to the, the connection between the weekly Sabbath, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the, the rest of the seventh day Sabbath, and the, the, I talked about the inheritance principle, how that the appointed times inherit this principle of Sabbath rest. And uh, the thing I wanted to make clear was that uh, not all of the appointed times are called Shabbaton. It's the fall feasts that are referred to as Shabbaton, so that the, the seven days are reflected in the seven months, that the, the week of months is an expression, an amplification of the seven days. The, the appointed times in the first month are high days, holy convocations, but like the weekly, day one is day one to what? So it's, it's connected to the Sabbath, it's leading you to the rest, the Shabbat, the Shabbaton of the Sabbath, but it's pointing in that direction. And so the spring feasts are pointing you to the, the rest that is coming at this time of the year. Uh, and, and so it's all part of the, the, the Sabbath principle. And understanding that the seventh day Sabbath is the source of all of the Sabbaths that come after us, after after this, in the in the uh, in the days uh, in the week, week uh, weeks seven weeks we mentioned the seven weeks leading to Pentecost and then in the seventh month that all this is part of the Sabbath. So that when in, in Isaiah I was thinking about this this morning when it says in Isaiah 66 when it says from one Sabbath to another, or one new moon to another, and one Sabbath to another. Uh, shall all flesh appear before me. Why is it that we think when it says from one Sabbath to another, we only think of weekly Sabbath? Because when it says from one Sabbath to another, could it include these as well? This is, it's a Sabbath category. And all of the Sabbaths that are connected, that all are pointing to the seventh day Sabbath, are all included in this. And, and that's some... Ex the, the new moon is a different category. So it mentions Sabbath, new moons. So because of the inheritance principle, this is referring to everything that is connected to the Sabbath. That's just one thought I wanted to, uh, to uh, give to you and to tidy up that point. Now, I want to share with you another thought in, Col in regard to Colossians chapter 2. And you remember... When I talked about the principle of the source and the channel, you won't forget that because I've said that many times, how that the God of heaven, God is the source and his son is the channel, but Satan came along and he said, I will ascend into heaven, I will be like the most high, and he creates this 
tension that exists between the two sources. It goes from source channel to source source. Now, when you get this tension, you're worshipping a God of tension, you get tension in the scriptures that don't exist. And we mentioned this between the tension between the Old Testament and the New Testament that exists when you have a wrong understanding. The law came by Moses and the King James translators inserted the word but. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. There was a tension that doesn't exist because the New Testament is an expression of the Old Testament. Okay, And when we get this clear in our minds, the, I, I would suggest to you there are more, um, how can I put it, we, we, there are more places where we need to tell translators to get their butt out of there. <laughs> is, that, is that a nice way to say it? <laughs> you won't forget that, will you? Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I want to share with you something that I think you will find interesting in Colossians chapter 2, because there is a but there. And I, want, I want us to just look at this for a minute. Colossians 2 and verse 17. Which are a shadow of things to come. And then there's that word, but. Now that word, but, in the Greek, is this, D-E. Now, if you go to the, uh, the, the genealogies, and it says, and Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob. The word and is D-E. If you, want, if you want a proper word for contrast, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you know what that word is in, in uh, Greek? The word but? This is interesting. Allah. I'm not saying anything. That's a different word. The, the word in Colossians is not, is not Allah, it's there. So when we, and when, when, you, when we read this verse, which are a shadow of things to come, and but there's a tension that's put into the mind. There's a tension that's created. I'm suggesting to you that the tension is not there. You can read this text, which are a shadow of things to come, moreover, the body of Christ that these shadows are linking you into the body of Christ, linking you into the fellowship of the experience of the body of Christ. This distinction is important. Now, I want to come back to verse uh, 16, where it says, meat and drink. Now, meat and drink. What, is meat and dr what do we understand meat and drink? food. When Jesus says, my body is meat, my drink, my, my uh, blood is drink, the, it's the communion. Come over to 1 Corinthians 10. I want to show you something over there. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Notice the word communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So meat and drink refers to the emblems. 1 Corinthians 10, 16. So meat and drink in this context, when we, when we come together for meat and drink, it's for communion, isn't it? Meat and drink are a symbol of communion. Now we come back to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Let no man therefore judge you in meat and drink or in respect of a holy day. What is the purpose of a holy day? Worship, Worship and? Communion. communion. We should put with communion, we should, that should include worship, shouldn't it? We're worshipping God for the gift of his son in communion. So it's worship and? 
same thing, communion. I'll just tick that there. New moon, what's, what was new moon for? Self-examination, Numbers chapter 10, to blow the trumpet, call an assembly. It was opportunity for communion, wasn't it? Communion. Sabbath. What's Sabbath for? Communion. All these things are to do with communion and worship of God. Let no man judge you in your communion experience with God, which are a shadow of things to come. What's, what's the shadow of... How is this a shadow? If we come to, uh, to uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we see darkly, yes, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 39 speaking of all the men of the old testament uh, all the people of the old testament all these having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise god having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect what is this verse saying that we're all going to go into the heavenly city together that they without us should not be made perfect. They don't go before us, we go together complete. From one Sabbath to another and from one new moon to, to another shall all flesh come and worship. When the whole body of Christ is fully manifested, what we are experiencing here now is a taste, it's a shadow of that great reality when we are all fellowshipping together as one body, the body of Christ, worshipping before the Father. And Paul is saying, don't let anyone judge you in these times which are a shadow of what's coming when we will all worship together. Does that make sense? Yes. The word communion doesn't just mean grape juice and left right. No, it doesn't. So he's talking about the principle of communion. And as it says in Hebrews 10.24, what does it say in 10.24? Uh, Hebrews 10.24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So it was the manner of some to dissuade people from gathering together for this kind of communion, which is a taste of what's coming. So in this sense, the shadow is not against the reality. The shadow is connecting you to the reality. The shadow is a channel to the reality. Now, I need to explain one more thing to you that's very important in terms of the Greek mind. One of the key... This revelation came to me on a new moon, by the way. Have you ever heard of the allegory of the cave by Plato? This is classic Greek thinking now. You have the entrance to the cave, you have the sun is out here, you have a wall that exists here and you have people that are chained, excuse my diagram, uh, and then you have this cave wall and you have people that are walking on the wall and the light comes in, comes in into the cave and it creates a shadow on the back of the cave. And the people are chained here, they can't see the reality. The reality is out here, the shadow is here. The enlightened ones realize that this is just a shadow. They break themselves through their chains and they turn in the opposite direction and they go out into the reality. Now, now this, this is putting the reality at war with the shadow. Okay? This is Greek thinking now. Shadows are bad things. Shadows are for foolish people. Shadows are for childish people. But the enlightened ones only deal in realities. They don't deal in shadows. But this, this, is, this is the two-source concept that shadows are against realities. There's a tension between them. And in order to receive the reality, you must reject the shadows. This is Greek Platonic thinking. This is not Hebrew thinking. Hebrew thinking has shadows as connecting you to realities. And we want to think about this for a moment. Think for a moment. I want to write something up on this because we need to address something. 
all sacrifices are shadows. The question is, are all shadows sacrifices? Amen. Are all shadows temporary? Are, there are shadows that are temporary. And I used this illustration this morning. If you're stuck in a river and someone throws you a line to get you out of the river in order that you can then walk to the tree of life, the rope was a temporary mechanism to bring you out and then you don't need the rope anymore but you still need the tree of life. The tree of life is... Is that the reality of God? Is the tree of life, is that the reality of God? Isn't it a channel? Isn't it a shadow? It's a channel to receive the life of God. The tree itself has no life in and of itself, but it's receiving life from the source. It's a permanent shadow, a permanent channel, so that not all shadows are temporary. Some of the shadows are eternal. And this is why we, in Colossians chapter 2, notice that it says, uh, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or, or in respect of a holy day, new moons or the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. All, these, all of these things, and this makes, makes me think, the new moon, the Sabbath and the, the, the holy days are all tastes, channels, that connect us to a reality that's coming in the future. And that suggests to me that the annual appointed times will continue in heaven because they are shadows of things to come. They are a taste. Yeah. Amen. If the moons do. Do you, do you, see, do you see light in this? To just remember, the Greek, remember the, the God of this world has two sources, which gives you a mindset of contrast. Platonic thought also has reality and shadow against each other. And that's why the God of this world is blinding the minds of the people of this world. The gospel is hid to them that are lost because they've got this conflict going on in the mind. So I would suggest to you that the person who put the word but in Colossians should get his butt out of there. Because it, it's pointing to a reality of communion that we are all going to experience. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And we will all in open communion, visible open communion, worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And we're tasting this right now, aren't we? Is what we are doing now against what we're going to experience in heaven? I hope not, because I'm enjoying this. So I, I just want you to, to keep those, these thoughts in mind. A different way of understanding this verse, it's, it's uh, uh, as it says, the, the body of Christ is a reference, and do a study on the word body of Christ. Uh, uh, Tasha mentioned it yesterday about referring to the church. There is one passage in Romans where it does refer to Christ. Uh, you're dead to the law through the body of Christ. But there are other passages where it refers to the church. And uh, I'm seeing that this is an issue of communion. And what Paul is saying here is don't let anyone stand in your way of tapping into this communion experience through these appointed times. That's what it's saying. And it, that's what I'm offering to us to consider uh, as, a, as something that I think is far more beautiful. And it, it's simple in the text. And all you have to do is to take that but out and just make it read which are a shadow of things to come, even the body of Christ. It's pointing you, connecting you straight into it. And that's what we're saying about the relationship between the seventh day Sabbath and the appointed times. We can taste the seventh day Sabbath in this appointed time. We can taste the reality. And I want to sh share with you one more text that, that really gets you thinking in Acts chapter 5 and verse 15 in terms of whether shadows are at war with reality. Uh, ask yourself why this, because uh, this verse in Acts 5.15 is exactly the same word for shadow as in Colossians 2. 
Uh, this is interesting. It says, 5.15, In so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that, the least, uh, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So when the shadow of Peter passed over the people, they were healed. Is there, was there life in the shadow? But was there life coming through the shadow? It was going through the shadow. That's interesting, isn't it? This, this, shadow, this shadow that Peter cast over the sick, was it an insult to Jehovah? No, it wasn't. It was bringing life. There was life in the shadow, but the life was not of the shadow. There's life in the shadow, but it's not of the shadow. Because of whom, by whom, the life was by the shadow, but it was not of the shadow. This is the great pattern. We see when we get this connection. I'm excited by that. That's, that's really good. Okay, I just wanted to share some thoughts with you. Now I want to... Uh, share with you in regard to the f uh, aspects of the first angel's message. And I just want to share with you a little bit about my experience. And this, what we've just shared, will relate. It will relate to the issue of the investigative judgment. We're going to come back to this contrast thinking that is causing trouble for many Adventists, many believers in understanding Revelation chapter 14. And this is something that I was made painfully aware of as a child. Now, being raised in the Advent movement in Australia in the late 70s and early 80s was quite a traumatic experience for those of us that were there. Uh, the, the best way I can describe it, and, and uh, there are some uh, plants in Australia that the seeds are so tightly bound that the only way that the seed can be released is through fire. And I would like to suggest to you that's what happened to me as a child living in Australia. It was like a fire that went through our community. In 1980, one third of the ministers of the, of the denomination in Australia resigned in Australia in 1980 over a conflict between the cross and 1844. There was a conflict mindset occurring that wasn't able to be resolved and one third of the ministry left. Another third of the ministry that still believed what was being taught stayed in and went underground. I think you experienced some of that here as well. Uh, and, but there were many other things going on for me uh, as a child. I was, in 1980, I was 13 years of age. Now you can work it out. And I, I distinctly remember, not long, it was in 1982, I was on a Pathfinder camp and we received the news that Lindy Chamberlain had been committed for the murder of her own child. And as a 14-year-old child, I looked into the heavens and I said, where are you? Where are you? Why have you allowed this to happen to us? The, the, the trial of Lindy Chamberlain for the murder of her baby has been the greatest judicial trial in Australian history, and it involves an Adventist pastor and his wife. Uh, when I went to university uh, in, uh, in 1987, I, I came into the university and uh, I was having discussion with some people, and uh, I mentioned that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. And this person said in front of a whole lot of other people, oh, you're the baby killers. That's a baptism of fire. As a young person, what do you do with that kind of information? Uh, we're the baby killers. Uh, and so that was a tremendous uh, challenge uh, for me. And it really set me to thinking about Adventism and how strong is this? Uh, we were faced, uh, I distinctly remember uh, after the book by Walter Ray came out, The White Lie, and this material came sweeping through Australia and the derision of the spirit of prophecy and people burning their spirit of prophecy books, selling them off, getting rid of them. This is the baptism that I had as a child uh, growing up in Australia. Australia is an arid desert place and it's certainly that way in terms of the truth uh, but
can, what does it say? There came a root out of a dry ground. So by God's grace, I come to you from Australia, hopefully as a root, <laughs> part of the root, a branch from the root out of a dry ground. Because uh, in Australia, things are pretty grim. As a result, we never recovered, we never really recovered from that experience. Uh, and when I was uh, in the seminary, uh, in, uh, I was training for the ministry in the 1990s, one of the lecturers uh, said there was a whole group of us ministerial students, and the lecturer said, stand up anyone who believes that we can have victory over sin. And so I and one other stood up. The rest of the class stayed seated. And then he began to berate us for the whole class about the, the foolishness of believing that we can have victory over sin. Uh, baptism of fire, you better believe it. But I thank God that my knees didn't weaken. He helped me because I'd read the Bible, I'd read the spirit of prophecy, I knew what it said and uh, I, knew, I knew where my bread and butter were and it wasn't with that lecturer. It was with the Word of God. And so I chose to hang on to that despite the pounding. But it did make me ask, how, can I validate these things? The, I was told uh, that, uh, you know, these men, they need to be paid. So they're very careful in the way they express themselves. They don't deny the teaching of the investigative judgment. They just reinterpret its meaning. Uh, in terms of actually going through books and that your sins are being transferred into the heavenly sanctuary and that, that there is going through of books and records, this is not happening. It was described to me that the Day of Atonement is Jesus coming out and just sprinkling a bit of blood and that's it. It's all over. That's all the investigative judgment's about. It's a symbolic gesture. It doesn't mean anything. And as was said to me on October 22nd, 1844, nothing happened in heaven. It was a non-event. Yeah. So that, that's, this is my theological training. This is what I was taught. That, well, this is what they tried to teach me. On the, on, the, uh, on the day of my graduation, one of the lecturers, my father knew one of the lecturers, and we were walking on the day of my graduation, and my father said to this particular lecturer, because they were friends, he, says, he said, Adrian, I hope that you learned well uh, your, the lessons from uh, your lecturers here and the lecturer turned around and said in a very sarcastic and wry manner Adrian has learnt nothing and I said hallelujah <laughs> I accepted that blessing I accepted that blessing I learnt nothing but I did learn something in that process of adversity I learnt that uh, I had to study. I would often, when I would sit in my psychology classes, my psychology lecturer became quite concerned about me because I would sit in those classes and there was a great struggle going on in my mind as I would sit and listen to these lectures and then I would go and read great controversy and then I would go back to my Bible and I would be pleading with God because of the, everyone, or most of the people around me were saying, investigative judgment's irrelevant doesn't mean anything. It's an aberrant doctrine. All of the, the churches know this, that it's foolishness to believe in this investigative judgment. But I'm reading what the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy is saying, and it's like a man sitting when a teacher's up the front, and he's holding up, three, uh, he's holding up two fingers, and everyone's yelling three, and you can only see two. What are you going to do in that situation? Are you going to get a new pair of glasses that allow you to see three when you can only see two? So uh, th this was my experience uh, when, when I uh, was growing up. And I share that with you to, to give you <laughs> some background uh, into what drove me to study this subject of the first angel's message. And so if we turn to uh, Revelation chapter 14... Verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every kindred and nation, uh, kindred and tongue and people. Now notice, it's the everlasting gospel that's being preached, but what is the, 
The source is the everlasting gospel. What is the channel by which we are receiving this everlasting gospel? It says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. Now all of this comes under the heading of everlasting gospel. Does that make sense? This is everlasting gospel. The hour of his judgment that is come is everlasting gospel. It's the good news. But there's that word. In the minds of men, the everlasting good news of the judgment has been put in contrast to the everlasting good news of the cross of Christ. So that these two things, the, the, the symbol of justification has been placed at variance with the symbol of sanctification. Because the Advent, Advent people were raised to proclaim a message of sanctification, a, a, a message of righteousness of faith, faith that is so pure that it would allow God's people to believe that you can have complete victory over sin. Now, you need to have a good understanding of righteousness of faith to make that kind of claim. Because for most of us, I think, when you look at yourself internally and you know yourself as a man or a woman, you know that humanly this is impossible. It's impossible to be perfect. But when you understand the righteousness of Christ, when you understand what is being offered to us through the sanctuary system, through the Jewish economy... We are offered a righteousness by faith that will stand the test of the investigative judgment. That's what I believe, brethren. It's a seed that abides in my mind and this seed will not be taken from my mind. I will cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against this belief. The God that I serve gives victory over sin. And it says... Worship him, and the, the key, you're given the key. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of waters. Nearly every word here is coming straight out of the fourth commandment. It's giving you a clue of how this is going to take place. That the seventh day Sabbath is at the heart of the sealing of God's people. And as we have been describing the seventh day Sabbath as an appointed time, as one day in seven, as a principle that is fanning out through all of God's appointed times, all of these things together are a part of the everlasting gospel and the sealing message of our God. This is what's being described in the first angel's message. And uh, what I, I want to put up here for you the great problem that has occurred amongst God's people is that we have the, uh, the cross and we have the most holy place experience, entering into the most holy place. Now, just to ask a question, what difference does it make of Jesus being in one apartment or another? He's in a holy place, he's in a most holy place. Okay, there's a difference in work. What does it signify to God's people? What does the shifting from the holy to the most holy signify? Because this is the message to Philadelphia, that the door was open, that there was open for them an, a door and there was shut a door. A door was shut and a door was opened. That's what signals the difference between the holy and the most holy. There was a door that was shut and there was a door that was opened. Okay? Now, getting this right is very important because those who did not follow Christ into the most holy place and in their minds remained in the holy place, what, when they prayed and said, Father, give us thy spirit, what spirit did they get? Satan's spirit. This is deadly, deadly serious. You want to know what it means to go in the most holy place. What it means to go into the most holy place is that when Jesus is in the most holy place, you know that he is going to lay off the garments of intercession for sin. And that he's going to do this before he returns to the earth, which means that his people that are living on the earth at this time will be fully cleansed. The sanctuary in heaven is cleansed and through the source channel principle, the sanctuary on earth becomes cleansed. What is a reality in heaven becomes a reality on the earth. This is 
what we understand in the most holy place. This is what the Advent people were raised to proclaim to the world, that Christ has moved his ministry and that there is a righteousness available to God's people through worshipping him that made the heavens and the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters, that if you enter into this Sabbath experience, you will receive a sealing through the righteousness of Christ that will perfect your character. Now, God's Advent people almost almost universally have rejected this message. And, as it says, in the time of Christ, the, scenes, the closing scenes of the life of Christ will be repeated in the last days. In the days of Christ, there was two men presented before the assembly. One was called Barabbas, the other was Christ. Barabbas means son of the father. There was a son of the father that came in his own name, proclaiming to be the Messiah. And then there was the son of the father who came in his father's name. The church overwhelmingly chose the wrong son of the father. And they crucified the right one. Is this happening today? Is that me or you? <laughs> okay, so the question, the point I want us to resolve here is the, rel the relationship between the cross and, and, and the most holy place. Do I need to do something? Battery's dead. Try that one. Maybe someone would like to press those. Hello? Oh yeah, there we go. Thank you, brethren. So, this relationship between the cross and the most holy place. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that the judgment, the message of the judgment, is just as important as the cross. Now that's anathema to most Christians. It's anathema to most Adventists. But, when you have a mindset of two sources, and, th and this is, there's one word that connects these two experiences. There's one word, and that word is this. Atonement. Was there an atonement on the cross? Was it a complete atonement? Yes, it was. <laughs> I'm testing you on the language. There was a complete atonement. But the complete atonement as a source. So that as a source, it manifests itself in the final atonement. The relationship between the cross and the most holy place is one of source and channel. In Christ Jesus, he perfected a human character on earth, which then would be fully manifested in 144,000. This is atonement, source, and channel. These are not against each other. Most people talk about the balance of, because this is justification, this, this symbolizes justification, this symbolizes sanctification. Most people understand justification and sanctification as a balance. Don't be blinded by the God of this world. Justification is the guarantee of sanctification. Source, justification is the source, sanctification is the channel. Does that make sense? These are not at war with each other. If you believe this, you will experience this. That's the reality. That we don't need to have a warfare existing between these, these two events. But I would, I would suggest to you, uh, and I'll just use 
some of you may not be familiar with these names, but I, I, men that were caught in this uh, contrast paradigm and, and emphasized two areas. Now, there was one man who came to our church and he emphasized this. Leroy Froome, in the book Questions on Doctrine, an emphasis on a completed atonement, and then this is just an afterthought. The most holy place experience is an afterthought experience later on. Now, there was another man who had a different emphasis, not as pronounced as Leroy Froome. That was Andreasen, the architect of the final generation theology. I would suggest to you, while there's many good things in Andreasen's final generation theology, it lacks the source channel expression and is in danger of creating a legalistic experience, which we saw specifically manifested in the 1980s as a reaction. And that reaction came from another man who gave an emphasis of this, who was a disciple of Froome in many ways, and he was an Australian. Desmond Ford, he gave this emphasis in contrast to this emphasis. But in, in, uh, in, the, in the father-son relationship, there is no tension. So in the justification and sanctification experience, there is no tension. One leads you to the other. But Satan wants to create a, a mindset that causes you to see them in tension. And there is no tension. If you believe this, you will experience this. This is, this is what I'm seeing in the Word of God. And, it's, and that's understanding that the word atonement is a source channel relationship. Because Satan wants you to focus on one or the other. He wants to split the, the atonement. And this is where the appointed times can help us, help us to avoid focusing on one and the other because each year as you participate and you come to unleavened bread, Passover and unleavened bread, you have the opportunity to focus on the justification that we receive through the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what it's for? And then seven months later or six months later, uh, you experience uh, Day of Atonement and Tabernacles where you're reminded each year of the experience going over these things. And I just, another point that I want to say about source and channel. We know that antitypically that we are living in the day of atonement. Now I have been uh, a Seventh-day Adventist uh, all my life. We have a problem. So I'm stop. That's better. I'm blowing hard. Is that better? Thank you. Is picking up the breath. Oh, put it down. Put it out. That better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you for putting up with that. Now, what was I saying? Ah, thank you. Antitypical Day of Atonement. All of I, I've, I have been. Well, I've been a believing Seventh-day Adventist since I was 17 years of age, but I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist environment. And believing that we live in the antitypical day of atonement, there was never once where the church that I attended called together an assembly in order to participate congregationally in the experience of the day of atonement. But if you're living in the antitypical day of atonement, shouldn't we be doing these things? So this is, this is where I see the source channel relationship of the, uh, of the Sabbath and the appointed times. Because the appointed times are providing you a channel to take hold of. It's a visible experience that allows you to take hold of the invisible reality. Without the visible, it's very hard. It's harder to take hold of the invisible reality of the antitypical Day of Atonement. And this is a principle that I tested last year at Tabernacles last year. Where I asked the Lord as we were going in, just before we went into Tabernacles, I presented that presenta a presentation called Lessons on Nineveh, which I touched on here as well. 
And what we experienced at that time was we took hold of the reality of the Day of Atonement as a corporate body. We entered into that experience and that the visible took us into the invisible. And this is what Jesus Christ is to us. That which we, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which our eyes have seen and our hands have handled. These appointed times allow us to handle spiritual realities. They allow us to touch them and connect. They are shadows of things to come. Those shadows are reality. They are channels by which we can connect to reality. They are not the reality, but channels to the reality. And they are not at war with the reality. This is the great point. This was the great deception of Plato and all of the Greek apologists of creating co-source ideas of God that create conflict in the thinking. And this is, this is why in my own experience, in order for me to understand righteousness by faith correctly, I had to come to the God of my fathers in order to get that understanding correct in my mind so that I wasn't putting these things at war because the God you worship sets the foundation for all of your theology. Does that make sense? Because it's either source channel or source source or source source source. Either way, you're going to get a different pattern of thinking. And so for me, the God I worship was intimately connected to an understanding of righteousness by faith. And that's why... It was worth standing up and say, brethren, I think we have a problem. This is not a non-salvational issue. This affects the way you think. This affects the side of the road you drive on and whether you bump into people or whether you stay alive in terms of your pattern of thinking. And so I want to offer that to you in terms of the first angel's message. And notice, notice... The very first words of the first angel's message, well, verse 7, saying with a loud ver verse, a voice, verse, loud voice, what's the first two words? Fear God. If you want to fear God, you need to know God. And this, this, is, the, this is the reality of those who first preached the third angel's message, or the first angel's message in the 1840s. If you read carefully, all of them had an understanding of the father and son that our pioneers had, including William Miller. If you study it carefully, in 1842, he gives an understanding of the God that he serves and it's at what our pioneers believe. Works of William Miller, Volume 1, 1842. Look it up, it's there. So he worshipped the true God, he feared the true God and it's upon this foundation that Adventism was built. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Now just a few final comments because we have to close up soon. When we, when we think of the judgment, uh, and I just want to mention that as a young person, I was attending an Adventist school in my final year of high school. I first encountered the, fir the three angels' messages because I had to memorize them for a test. And if I didn't memorize them, I would have failed the test. So that motivated me to, to memorize them. So as I memorized them, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Uh, Babylon has fallen and if, if any man received the mark, etc., etc. For me, that was, that was saying, God is going to judge you. Babylon has fallen. The other churches are already damned. And if you don't get your act together, I'm going to burn you with fire and brimstone. And that's what I understood as a young person. I think that's what many Adventists understand because by nature, as it says in the parable of the talents, the one who had the one talent said, I knew you that you were a hard man. Did he know any such thing? That was a lie. He didn't know that at all. He was making it up. But it's in the interest, the carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So it's important for him to make up lies about God to justify his sinful life. This is, this is the experience being described. And so uh, my introduction to the three angels' messages was one that was quite uh, negative in that respect. But when I came... When I had an, a conversion experience when I was 17, and let me just mention that briefly, that when I was 17 years of age, coming to a point where I 
was frustrated with the way that I was living, I had uh, had some interactions with my parents where it was becoming very evident that I was changing because of the music I was listening to, because of the lifestyle of the movies and music that I was living as an Adventist young person, like most Adventist young people at that particular time, that it was causing rebellion in my life. It caused conflict uh, with my parents. I began to interact with them in very uh, inappropriate ways, in defying them. And the Lord began to speak to me and said, is this the way you want to live? And I, I was convicted I wanted to change. And so uh, I went to my mother and she gave me the book Steps to Christ. I began to read that book. I was given that book when I was 14. It was like reading Chinese. For me, it was boring. Couldn't turn the movie back on. Put that aside. When I was 17, I had a need. And when I had a need, the Saviour was ready to fill that need. And he said, uh, as I was reading, it says on page 13, I'll never forget, it's on page 13 of the book Steps to Christ. Behold him in the wilderness, behold him in the garden, behold him upon the cross. And the Spirit of God illumined my mind and I beheld Jesus Christ upon the cross in my mind. And I believe under the inspiration of the Spirit that as I looked upon the Lamb of God upon the cross, he looked at me and I saw in his face such love that it changed my heart. I knew that he was on that cross because of me. I knew that he was suffering because of me. And yet what I saw in his face, I believe God showed this to me, it was only love in his face. And that melted my heart. And it released a torrent of guilt and iniquity and sin. And as I knelt there on my knees at 17 years of age, I... I cried out to God and just cried and cried all of the pain and suffering that, that I had put on other people and other people had put on me and my resentments and my self-pity and my indulgences because of these things. All of them were just washed away. What an experience. I have walked in the light of that experience. As ye therefore receive Christ, so walk ye in him. I have sought to walk in that experience from that day forward. I have fallen many times but a righteous man falls seven times but he gets up again the, the the thing because of that experience that i've had with christ i have no fear of the judgment because i know my redeemer i know my savior and i am confident i pray you also will be confident that when your name is called out in the judgment behold it i see my savior standing and he puts out his hands and he says father my blood for my son adrian he's mine he's given his heart to me he's mine i believe that's what he's going to do by faith and that at any moment my name may come up I believe that he will complete the work that he has started in me because I have been to Passover. I have beheld the lamb which taketh away the sin of the world. I've, I, I've walked to Pentecost. I've come to atonement and I expect to experience tabernacles. And on the last great day when we enter heaven to walk in and celebrate with all the redeemed. Is that what you plan to do? Let us kneel and talk to our Father. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to come before you through Christ our Lord as your redeemed sons and daughters. Father, we choose to believe by faith that when our names come up in the judgment, because we believe that the books are open and the judgment is set, this is what we have been given as a people, that you will give us the righteousness as we come Sabbath by Sabbath and new moon by new moon to receive of the life, the outgiving, the outflowing life of Christ, that you will seal us, that you will fill us, that our hearts will be united fully with Christ, and we will come into the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, and that you will cause us to ride upon the high places of the earth, because we call the Sabbath a delight. And I thank you for hearing this prayer, Father, in 